Yeah, welcome everybody. Seems the keynote uh, has ended. Obviously, there are still uh, people coming in. <coughs> That's how it is at this conference. Welcome and good morning, everyone. I'm talking a little bit about uh, Linux kernel and what's happening there and how that might be relevant for you. It's actually, I think I'm doing it for the fifth or sixth times here on this conference. And let's go straight in. A quick orientation. Where are we? Uh, this is how kernel.org looks like uh, <coughs> right now. Actually, the latest kernel is 5.4.14. Uh, and that's actually a long-term kernel. That's uh, um, a bit different than the other kernels, uh, kernels you, uh, that get released. Get released. It uh, gets supported for two years, actually. Um, most of the r recent long-term kernels, in the end, actually got support uh, for six years. It remains to be seen if that will be true for the uh, Linux 5.4 uh, uh, kernel also. All the other kernels are normally just um, supported for around about 10 to 13 weeks, like 5.5, uh, <coughs> uh, which is under, under development. Um, release is expected on February the 3rd. Uh, that's basically uh, nine days from now. And actually, it could be a week earlier, so uh, it could be tomorrow night, actually. And, uh, or maybe a week later, that always depends on how things evolve and what, what kind of feeling Linux has, uh, how, how things are. Uh, 5.6 thus is expected in uh, mid-April. It's uh, likely a little bit too late for Ubuntu uh, 20.04, the next long-term stable release from Ubuntu. Um, and it uh, might be too late for Fedora 32. Both get released a little bit later than mid-April, but it might be too, too short time to actually integrate. It depends on what the dev developers actually do. And I can pr predict that easily because uh, re new releases uh, nearly all of the time come out every nine or 10 week. So it's pretty predictable. It's actually, I think it's April 8 or April the, um, 13th where, when 5.6 will come out. And it's possible because uh, it's actually um, it's a well-tuned engine. That's something uh, Jonathan Corbett from LWNNet once said, uh, because everything runs straight ahead. Um, each kernel, new kernel release has about 13,500 changes, uh, right, and uh, brings about 300 lines of uh, new code. Actually, it's uh, normally like 800,000 um, new lines and uh, 500,000 go out. Uh, if you look at this diff stats, so you got an idea how much change there is happening. A few recent happenings um, at this point. Um, last year, um, I showed a slide uh, that said there were a few hiccups recently. Um, so much for the well-tuned, because it was really uh, a little bit, uh, 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 a lot of things were happening then, especially in the media covered a lot of things in the Linux kernel. There was a breakage with ZFS on Linux, and there's a big performance problem. There was a corruption block uh, uh, when, when writing data, and especially the code of conduct and the Linux, uh, Linux break in the, in the fall. That was quite, uh, cooked quite a lot of uh, 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 in the media. Uh, but this year, I can say there are no similar disturbances in the force recently. Um, uh, and the uh, code of conduct that was much discussed uh, uh, 10 months ago, it's nothing much heard of. So it's, uh, everybody said it might be a big, big problem. Uh, in the end, um, there were a few incidents that got reported how the code of conduct says it has to be reported. Um, those are, if you want to uh, see the details about that, you can find them on kernel.org these days. Actually, there were only five reports in 2019. So it's uh, really not that much of a problem as many people uh, uh, feared it might be. Um, there's one thing uh, I need to mention here. There was some disturbance um, in, in the kernel world recently. That's more for kernel development. There was at the Linux Plumbus conference uh, talk by, by a kernel developer that um, is uh, very um, active in the security. Uh, area. Um, uh, he actually works for Google. Um, he talked about what's wrong with uh, kernel developer development. There are so many things that are not working good. Like, uh, what did he? What is this? He mentioned uh, patches get lost and uh, lots of duplicate work and many many other problems. And um, yeah, if you're interested in details, uh, check out this uh, LWNnet article. 
And uh, it actually links to the slides. And if you want it really detailed, uh, you, there's actually a bit, bit of big, the video of this um, session available on YouTube. And uh, thanks to the talk, it actually uh, a work group um, <coughs> was started to actually bring uh, Linux kernel development a, a bit uh, forward and make it more modern, uh, to make it more, more to, so it works <coughs> better. So it, and the basic goal is improving and defragmenting uh, the kernel development workflow. Um, there were some results already. Um, that um, There's another LWN that article that goes into details. Um, it's a lot of work ahead, and so I won't go into the details here because it would be boring. Um, it, and it remains to be seen what comes out of it. It's uh, likely looking better <coughs> in the end. There's actually some people likely won't like that much uh, uh, a Garrett instance now since a few days, uh, where, where, um, which developers can use to submit pet series and actually uh, um, look at the changes even better than, than it's possible on the, on the mailing list. Um, it um, remains to be seen how kernel developers will like that and what uh, optimizations need to be done uh, so uh, this uh, really works out in the end and makes kernel development better. Uh, but no, if you want to uh, make kernel development, uh, if you want to see that on GitLab or GitHub, that won't happen. I'd, I'd say maybe some subsystems will use it a little bit. Uh, that was always discussed here and there, um, but I, uh, Linux likely um, <coughs> won't do that because kernel development is uh, really um, uh, email driven and uh, uh, switching to such a fork like, a fork like that uh, would be kind of disturbance that's not going to happen at least anytime soon. There was another bit of a stir recently um, uh, that was uh, Linux saying don't use ZFS. It's that simple. I think you've all heard about it. ZFS um, is this uh, uh, file system and volume management integrated solution that was developed for Solaris. You can use it on, um, on uh, Linux with uh, ZFS on Linux. Um, as I said, most of you have likely heard about it. I won't go into the details. Yes, there's one thing I want to uh, point out. Um, he said something about uh, ZFS there. Uh, a lot of people from the ZFS community did, did like. Um, he actually said it's not maintained and things like that. Um, when he said that, he actually meant uh, the ZFS from Oracle here, not the or, uh, open ZFS that's used in some BSD uh, operating systems or ZFS on Linux. Uh, he clarified that in a different post um, that's linked here. So lots of the media coverage didn't mention that, and that uh, um, um, uh, really, so the articles you read on the net are, are not really co uh, appropriate for what uh, Linux wanted to say. Um, but the main message is there's no hope for ZFS merge in Linux anytime soon. And that's also expected with the well-known uh, licensing issues that's uh, around there. Um, because the uh, ZFS code that's uh, coming from Solaris actually is on the CDDL. And that's uh, likely incompatible to the GPL used by the Linux kernel. But it's good that he clarified that, that it won't happen. And yeah. And even if this licensing stuff gets resolved, I think there are even <coughs> way other problems ahead uh, that would um, prevent a quick merge. There were actually some patents. Uh, there was a lawsuit between NetApp and Sun and Oracle that actually was um, settled in 2010, but both parties didn't say uh, how they settled it or how they agreed. So maybe Oracle can't even uh, change the licensing and uh, <laughs> to make sure it gets um, um, Linux com compatible, we don't know. And uh, there's another problem. There's actually code quality and interaction um, because uh, uh, ZFS and the ZFS on Linux stuff does a little, a few, quite a few things differently than Linux file system normally do. So the kernel maintainers in those areas like file systems and block storage likely uh, would have to uh, would rec uh, re <coughs> say they want to see some changes before that gets merged. So my um, opinion there is better stay away from um, ZFS on Linux for now. Uh, obviously, you can do that if you want to, but um, if this all this stuff never gets resolved, you have to you likely have to switch to ButterFS or some other file systems we never have heard of until today, sooner or later. And um, if the situation changes, uh, you obviously 
uh, can we ever evaluate? And maybe, maybe um, investing in ButterFS or some other file system would be the better approach anyway, because that's what we have already. And um, yeah, that's uh, of benefit uh, for Linux uh, uh, already. And maybe uh, fixing all the, those little things that are not yet get perfect in ButterFS, uh, ButterFS would be less work than bringing ZFS into Linux. It's hard to say. So that was um, the end of, uh, of this thread. Um, a few major happenings that are um, right now <coughs> up, up front that uh, WireGuard support expected in Linux 5.6. Uh, WireGuard is actually a quite a, um, a promising and much praised um, uh, tunnel solution for VPNs. Uh, Linus actually praised it quite a lot in 2018. And uh, there was a it, it's stateless, it's really easy configuration, quick reconnect. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people that experimented it or used it um, liked it very much. And uh, the thing is, until now, you have to recompile a kernel module with all this uh, WireGuard stuff, and that's hard. And that was <coughs> the reason why, why, because there was this uh, crypto library that the WireGuard relies on. It actually was developed especially for WireGuard, and that was called, or is called Sync. Um, and um, the crypto developers in the Linux kernel didn't like that much, but um, one of them actually stepped up and finally um, found a proper solution that was um, merged in, uh, uh, for 5.5. So uh, this gets so the basic problem is out of the way. It's actually called Frankensync, if you wonder, because they are. Um, it's uh, the, um, from Frankenstein Monster uh, because the Zinc and some other solution were merged. Or, or Zinc was um, reworked a little bit, and that's why it's called Frankenzinc. Yeah, but that's in 5.5, and in 5.6, uh, WireGuard support will follow, so it will soon show up in um, in the Linux kernel and Linux distributions. Another major happening, um, real-time support soon um, gets into the <coughs> mainline. When exactly is uh, uh, remains to be seen. And those of you that have been here last year actually might remember I mentioned that last year already. So I was kind of wrong there. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll get to that. It's not, I was not totally wrong. If you're wondering what the uh, real-time support is uh, there for, it's actually for the um, industry usage for Linux, for, for example, uh, to make your laser cutter and uh, machine, all the machinery used to build cars or something. Uh, there you often need real-time uh, support to make sure um, the, the machine uh, reacts uh, um, in time before um, you have to throw the w away the parts um, um, uh, because the laser reacted too, 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 too slowly or something. Yeah, but industry usage is uh, one of the drivers, but there are other usages as well. Um, as I said, I mentioned that last year already. I was kind of wrong with that because not everything is there yet, but uh, kind of right because the option to actually enable this is actually in the Linux kernel support already. It's called config uh, preempt RT. And uh, that happened in 5.3, but there are some things this option depends on, so you can't see them actually, and uh, it's not usable yet. Um, and there's actually, I think, only one major thing missing there. That's uh, reworking printk. That's the stuff the kernel uses internally to lock th something. And uh, that's actually in the works. Um, there's an LWNnet article about it. Um, if you want uh, to know more deta details about that, there's also Linux Plumber conference sessions, I think, that are available on YouTube. Um, it's not yet really foreseeable when this um, print K um, rework will actually get merged. It looks like 5.7 uh, seems to be the earliest possible target, um, but uh, maybe it uh, will take uh, two or three more releases more. It's hard to say because it was only sent to the kernel mailing list once in December, and then since then um, nothing much happened. So there's a still a bit fine tuning that needs to be done before that can can be fixed. But the road to actually get this into the kernel um, is uh, clear now after some discussion that happened on the Plumbers conference last um, fall, last September to be exact. If you want to know more about that, there's a great uh, a video there from the kernel recipes in Paris. Um, from Stephen Rostad. Um, the link is down here. That's 
that explains the situation and what you need to do if you are interested in RT development um, to make sure that uh, your apps work with it and your kernel drivers work with it. And just a small reminder, um, real time doesn't mean faster, it in the end means predictable. So um, for the standard kernels you have on Ubuntu or Fedora, it will likely not get enabled because the throughput, throughput uh, gets a little bit down um, if you uh, use this option. Uh, so for the default kernels, it doesn't make much sense, but as an alternate kernel, it's likely um, to get offered if that's got mainlined. <coughs> Uh, another major happening that's happening um, uh, quite slowly is the uh, BBPF, um, or sometimes called eBPF, that's changing the Linux kernel slowly, but in really a lot of ways. And um, uh, that's why a lot of things don't notice this. Well, so what is the BBPF? It's a programmable uh, VM in the Linux kernel. Uh, VM not a, like a virtual machine you use with a VMware, so more like a VM you use uh, comparable with the Java VM, but quite different again. And um, you can do that to get to write programs that are executed within the kernel, and that can make things um, more <coughs> uh, easy and quicker because some data doesn't have to, to, to get moved from, from the kernel space to user space. That's like uh, one of the oldest users with the old BPF, that was a classic BPF, BPF it's called these days, was TCP dumped to make sure uh, you only, uh, the, the kernel only forwards the packages to user land um, uh, that TCP dump is interested in. And that really needs to um, be done with something like the B BBPF. Um, uh, as it's m way too much data to copy everything out to, to this program. Yeah. But as I said, it's used in many other areas these days. Um, right now, it mostly shows itself in uh, TC, it's the traffic control stuff, and uh, XDP, that's a network fast path that was added like uh, two years ago. Two, yeah, yeah. And um, some tracing and performance monitoring tools um, 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 BPPF compiler collection and BPF trace. And as it's uh, a lot of Red Hat people here, actually it's, um, some of that is supported in Red Hat Enterprise Linux now with 8.2. I think the traffic control feature um, for, the net, for, for steering the, the data was already supported in 8.1. But with 8.2, um, which is in beta right now, the BPPF compiler collection and the uh, uh, and its uh, library will be uh, fully supported in Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Uh, the BPF tracing language, which you can use, you can, it's, it's, it's kind of a D-trace-like solution to, to, to uh, build small programs that get you the data you're only interested in. That is still a technology preview, and the Express Data Pass is also still a technology preview, but I, I suppose sooner or later that will change. If you're interested in this performance stuff I mentioned with BCC and uh, BPPF, BPF Trace, <coughs> um, there's actually a great book from Brandon Gregg, uh, um, BPF uh, Performance Tools. Uh, it's quite a thick book. I haven't seen it already, but it gets all the um, details um, how to actually use it. And a few of you might likely ha have seen this um, um, diagram here on the right uh, side. Uh, down, down there, um, that it shows um, where you can actually, uh, the, the, a lot of small utilities you can use to look into the kernel and what is done. And if uh, the black ones are the older tools and the red ones are new, newer, more uh, capable tools that use BPPF or, uh, and all that stuff to get more data, more efficient without, uh, with less overhead to make sure uh, if you're doing performance analyzing or tracing that uh, it's not <coughs> impact so much on, on your workload. There are a lot of small improvements in BPPF land uh, that promise even more usage and more uh, improvements uh, that are happening uh, or happened recently or happening right now. Here's a small list of the things that happened recently. I won't go into the details what, what each, each of the, uh, them are, is doing because that uh, w would likely be boring to most of you. And uh, uh, just to Quite sum it up. Um, uh, the thing is, um, together they are like are, are kind of a building a building blocks for a quite different Linux kernel. 
And uh, also they have, will have an impact on the Linux OS. And to illustrate this a little bit more how the impact is, if you look at the DEF CON uh, schedule and uh, search for BPPF, uh, you will find uh, what, a dozen talk, nearly a dozen talks um, that have BPPF in the description already. So you, uh, you can see it has an impact on, on a lot of different areas. It's tracing and um, container stuff. And so there's really um, happening a lot. Actually, um, it might turn out to revolutionize Linux a little, little bit. Um, um, remains to be seen how things evolve. Um, on LWNNet, which some of you might know is a great uh, website to, to check what, um, what's happening in the Linux kernel. Um, they, are actu they actually mentioned already there's a microkernel stuff. Uh, it, or it makes a Linux more like a microkernel. And actually, some, someone, one from the Red Hat uh, that's working on network stuff actually also uh, recently mentioned it's let's, Linux becomes more like a BPF powered microkernel uh, thanks to all the recent improvements that are happening there. Yeah, sadly, uh, the two t things I just mentioned, uh, so the real time and the BPPF stuff do not work together. I fix this. You, fix, you fixed or you fix? I fixed it. You fixed it? Oh, I didn't know, I know that yet. I posted patches that, that you know, Okay. Yeah, that's, this is David Miller. This is your, uh, the, a person you need to thank for, for all the networking stuff that's uh, happening with your uh, machines because he maintains the Linux kernel network stack. And as he said, uh, he fixed it. Or I think some fine tuning is needed. 100% to Thomas's satisfaction. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then. Uh, okay. Um, uh, the audience, for, for the records here, the audience mentioned that uh, there's also problems with trusted boot uh, and BPPF. But uh, that's always an issue when there are some new revolutionizing techniques, there are problems, and most of the time solutions can be found to work that out. That was actually um, the first part of the talk, and uh, I'd um, like to give you the chance to ask some questions uh, in, a, in a minute. Uh, a quick uh, introduction, I didn't do that in the beginning to not bore you that much there. Um, who, who am I actually? Um, I'm not a kernel developer, I actually, um, I'm a journalist for, for a living. I write a lot of things about the Linux kernel in a German magazine. Actually, some of that stuff a few years ago got uh, translated to English, but that sadly stopped. Um, I did some regression tracking work a few years ago. Sadly, I, I did that actually in my, uh, my spare time. Sadly, the spare time wasn't available anymore. Maybe that um, uh, uh, changes soon. I hope so, actually. And a few people actually might know me from Twitter because I'm Twittering lots of stuff that have happening in the Linux kernel area or, th uh, or things that are close to the Linux kernel. And I did a lot of things. Um, for Fedora, that's also a reason why I'm actually on this conference in particular. I did that when things like that were uh, up, up to date and everybody liked that. That was like 15 years ago or something. But the older one from you might remember that, uh, that everybody found that cool and now, no, nobody has anything like that today. And I'm building uh, Linux kernel vanilla packages for Fedoras and if any of you are interested in, in them. So from, from, uh, if you want to check if a bug is uh, uh, happening due to uh, a patch in the, uh, uh, that the Fedora kernel developers added. Um, you can t use these kernels or you can use these kernels in from those rep repositories to actually run the latest mainline kernel and, and to check out and help develop and developing and checking it and testing it without actually building it. So any questions on the topics so far? That gives you and me a quick break. We have a mic here if somebody wants to walk around. As I said, the main things are the code of conduct to remember, uh, the workflow, ZFS, real-time BPF. And we have BPF experts here, so if you have any questions about it. <laughs> There's a question. Alistair? Over. The right. It's more like a comment on, on ah. ZFS. Um, Could you? Yeah, yeah. If, if it's a, com it's wait. A, if it's a comment, wait for the mic. That makes everything easier. So it's more like a comment for ZFS first. Uh, who is using ZFS in this, uh, in this audience? That makes... Okay, so there are a few. Uh, 
One of the things that was not raised um, on, on the mailing list or anywhere else is that ZFS is portable. Uh, I can connect my ZFS volume to the, this Mac laptop, laptop or to, to a Windows box, and BitRFS is nowhere close to, to this. So some effort in keeping ZFS just for that, otherwise you're, you're stuck with XFAT whenever you want to exchange volumes, which is a pain. Okay. Any more comments or questions? What's the state of shifting file systems for uh, user namespace? Actually, I don't know. I saw that James submitted it in December, I think, uh, or to explain it. Then ask about uh, shifting file systems. That's important for container usage um, to make for as, um, some uh, to make sure the uh, UIDs uh, don't get mixed up. Uh, in the containers and, and the host, host, ID, uh, host system. Um, I think uh, James submitted this. I saw a few um, questions about it, but um, I, I can't say. Is anybody in the audience that followed it more closely than I did? I, I, I don't expect it to get merged anytime soon. And uh, it's a complicated thing, and uh, it will take some time. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> There's a short question. Okay, uh, what about DBus? There was this uh, KDBus a few years ago. Um, it was an interesting concept, uh, but the de developers abandoned it. Uh, the developers actually um, built something new in Userland. That's Dbus, please help me. Anyone with the name? What was the name? Dbus. It's it's. Huh? No, no, no. Um, it's it's um, it's it's a different than Dbus implementation that performs better and actually is used in Fedora 31 uh, or 30 30 already, I think. And um, the developers that were behind those efforts were uh, drove that. Uh, but these days, uh, they moved on and do something different. So it seems they are satisfied. So I don't, would not expect any IPC mechanism or more, D -bus, K, more work on KDBus or something in the Linux kernel. Varlink? Uh, Varlink? Yeah, Varlink is more, more uh, like a user land stuff uh, how, how that uh, gets uh, uh, used. Is it actually used over DBus? I don't know. Yeah, it's not, not something that compute, com competes uh, in that space. Yeah, so let's move on. I already have um, half an hour used. Actually, um, yeah, the slot behind this is free, so m maybe I can talk a little bit longer, but I don't want to keep you all here. Um, but um, this, uh, yeah, to move on, the second part will be a bit more about, uh, it will be a little bit quicker about recent changes and things that are work in pro progress that are either useful or helpful uh, in day to day. And that's why I want to uh, tell you about them or good, important to know. And uh, one of the useful, helpful uh, things uh, that is, this, uh, is uh, happening in the file system area. Um, yeah, uh, as you might know, in Linux there are basically three major file systems, ButterFS, X4, and XFS. And um, I'm not uh, talking like Dan Walsh and have, uh, 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 have let you all stand up and repeat something, but I want to get, make sure you are a little bit awake and want to ask you a question about it. Um, to, before I do that, a quick uh, explanation. Copy and write is something uh, you can use to uh, copy big files or directory trees in a fraction of a second. Um, that's actually one of the cool features um, from the ZFS I already mentioned, and um, it's supported by the Reflink feature. <laughs> and it's interesting for snapshotting, provisioning, container images, sharing files, and like, like that. So, raise your hands if you're listening. Okay? I ha could, should have checked uh, how many did that in the first second. So. Raise your hands if you have heard about deduplication or copy on, with copy on write. Okay, that makes about 70 percent, I'd, I'd say. So, if you think ButterFS supports it, okay, that are just um, 10, 15 percent. XFS, 
that are less, like, like 10% x4? <laughs> Nobody. Yeah, that's better than I expected. Um, ButterFS and ZFS actually support this. It's really cool to, to copy big, big directories, and x4 does not. And um, I wanted to see with this small experiment um, if some of you know about that XFS learned that recently, actually. Uh, in the Linux kernel side, it happened during the 4.x 4, 4 and 5.x uh, uh, days with a reflink feature. Uh, that happened in small steps, and not many people um, and noticed this. Uh, but it's actually default and productionary since uh, XFS box uh, 5.0 that actually came out of, uh, a few months ago already. Um, but um, it didn't get much attention in the media that this is possible to do now with uh, XFS these days. Uh, if you want to know more about that, there was recently a um, um, uh, blog post from the Oracle uh, blog um, from, from the XFS main developer uh, where you can um, uh, find, uh, uh, where he explains this, how to use it, and explains the status of it. Um, by the way, if I see somebody um, picturing it, the slides are on the, on the schedule, and uh, there you can download it and follow all the links if you're interested in, in them. And uh, I, I mentioned Oracle there. Oracle was kind of a driving force behind that. Um, but XFS um, uh, is also the main uh, file system on, on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and there it's um, supported since RHEL 8 already. So um, this copy on write feature is uh, uh, something that's used already. Uh, but on the other hand, I'd, I'd say it will take likely years uh, until a lot of people know about that. It's a bit like the L, uh, LVM snapshots are a very slow thing. Uh, those from the device map and LVM crew here uh, remember that uh, was used to be the case until like five or ten years ago, and then some new mechanism showed up to and make make uh, to make to improve the situation. But a lot of people still think uh, LVM snapshots are very slow, even if it's untrue, and that's likely the problem with this XFS feature as well. Another cool feature uh, XFS gets these days is online FS check. Uh, it's nearly uh, stable these days. There was also a blog entry recently that explains the status about this um, and uh, how to actually use it. Um, yeah, that's all. Uh, the URL is there also. So another helpful, useful feature, this time not um, for the enterprise admins here, more for the users uh, that use Linux on your, on your desktop. XFAT support is in uh, uh, 5.4, and that uh, makes it easier to mount uh, uh, your SD cards from your modern cameras, like video cameras, um, because they often use XFAT, which is a Microsoft file system, but there are some patterns involved, so uh, n nobody wants to touch it in the Linux kernel, but Microsoft has uh, recently stepped up uh, to solve this situation. Um, thing is, in Fedora, this um, module is not um, enabled right now, um, that's likely because um, also still due to the patent situation, um, I guess uh, once Microsoft ships it, um, it should be covered and then Fedora might, like, uh, might um, enable it. Other developments, uh, other Linux distributions are likely not waiting that long. Um, there's actually what got added is an interim sol solution. Uh, there's a better implementation um, that was called SDFAT uh, in the staging tree that's actually uh, really close to getting merged. A lot of uh, one crucial developer act uh, most of the patches already, but Alvero found uh, a few uh, problems and uh, m might not happen in 5.6, but uh, maybe in 5.7 <coughs> this better, better improved driver uh, gets added. So what else? Um, there was a, um, another uh, file system added in 5.4. It's called WordIOFS, and that's a, a way more efficient uh, way to share files between host and guests. It's a bit similar to um, 9P. Some of you might have uh, heard, heard about uh, that's actually used in, in these cases uh, right now quite a lot. Uh, but it's actually promising. It promises uh, to deli deliver better performance. There's still op some optimization work ne that needs to be done. Um, yeah, but uh, it's, that's happening. The code is actually uh, based on, uh, partly based on Fuse stuff. Um, if you want to know more about this, um, there's actually a, a great web website um, um, that explains things like the, uh, all the details. 
Uh, sadly, the, stuff, uh, the support side in QAML is still a uh, work in progress, unless somebody says it's merged. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty, pretty clear. Yeah, somebody. Yeah, it's pretty close to get merged. I think there were, were hundred pe yeah, patches. So, yeah, well, but it seems uh, it's not that far away to get merged. So hopefully we can all use that easily um, to to share files between hosts and and guests uh, soon. So what else uh, is there? There's actually um, uh, I O U ring thing that matches. I mentioned that uh, last year already. Um, this is a technique that finally brought proper asynchronous I/O, AIO for short, um, to Linux last year. It's actually easy to use, at, l at least compared to the other AIO uh, things we had in, in Linux, and works a lot better and uh, way quicker. And um, it's uh, actually something the Linux world has kind of waiting for quite a lo long time because in the Windows world, uh, AIO is actually quite standard. Um, that's always a little bit uh, for, for some developers uh, find that odd that it's not uh, that the Linux world still uses synchronous I/O. And yeah, um, but that's about to change maybe. Uh, it, that used to be bad in Linux because the kernel support wasn't the best, yeah, but the, this new solution actually uh, improved uh, things quite a lot. And in the past few months, got a lot of fine tuning and a few more features, and uh, also was uh, praised quite a lot. And uh, if you wonder why is that re relevant, because SSDs get getting faster. It's getting crazy faster. Uh, and. Uh, basically, to use all the power they offer, you um, need to um, uh, have asynchronous I/O. So, if you're doing uh, um, application development that really needs I/O performance, consider using it. Uh, if you need high throughput or low latencies, that's an interesting solution. Um, there's a talk um, uh, with all the details um, from the uh, kernel recipes again. Uh, this from Jens Expo. Is, is it actually pronounced like this? I think so. Okay. <laughs> okay. And um, there you find all, all, the, all the details. And actually, there was a LWNet article yesterday uh, that explains some of the recent features and, um, and all, uh, uh, what, what, what's possible with this AIO interface these days. If you're interested in uh, look at it. It's still subscriber only for now, but in 10 days or something, it will be free. And the fun thing, if you didn't believe the BPPF uh, thing, stuff I um, uh, mentioned earlier, uh, on LWN that it's becoming a kind of running gag to uh, um, mention things like this, where, um, where BPPF is uh, uh, offered a solution uh, for, for problems developers face in other areas. Uh, that's the same here with the AIO stuff. It remains to be seen if BPPF will be used, um, but uh, as I said, it's becoming a running gag because it's used in, in, uh, in places where nobody expected it uh, a few years ago. Um, yeah. So another useful feature that's again more for the administrators here. Um, there's a, a new I/O controller that's called Block I/O Cost that was added in uh, 5.4. Was used to be called I/O Wait. Um, so it's uh, way better and more flexible I/O controller. If you have your multiple containers or VMs and want to make sure none of them can can starve the others by uh, uh, um, doing lots of I/O, then this is important. I, there were other I/O controllers, but um, one of the things uh, the new I/O controller does better is it only limits uh, when there's actually contention. So you can use all the I/O you want. Um, until there's some contention, and that, then it actually limits to make sure that your important uh, applications uh, get enough I/O. Uh, one thing to note here is uh, that it's a C Group 2 controller, so the more modern version of C Group 2 uh, of, of the control groups uh, uh, that are used for for um, resource isolation and and things like that. Um, uh, uh, so you really have to use C groups too, but um, that's the move to C groups too finally is hap happening after years of production. It's actually uh, used in Fedora 31 already. Um, uh, Rel 8 actually has it, and if you want to know more about this, there's a um, talk about this tomorrow. I don't know in which room. Brave new world of unified C group uh, hierarchy. 
Uh, that gives you a, a lot of details, I, 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 I expect. So, um, another useful, helpful feature that's about to get merged with Linux kernel, um, 5.6 likely will get USB 4 support. So, let's now check again who's awake. Uh, who cares? Hands up. And not that much. Thing is, uh, for, for the record, it was like five hands or maybe five five percent or something. The thing is, all of you should care. Uh, USB 4, that sounds like a new technique that uh, maybe comes somewhere and you don't care much, but the thing is, it's not that far away. The next generation of Intel processors for mobile and desktop, uh, so the Core i11 series or whatever Intel will call it, uh, that's expected to have USB 4 because it's uh, basically based on Thunderbird 3 and Intel had already controllers, so it's not that hard to implement for them. And the thing is, so you have this hardware coming out on, on, on uh, this year's summer, and uh, in a year or two, it's likely um, a pretty standard. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Ubuntu uh, 2004 is li it's likely won't use 5.6 uh, yet, and that becomes a problem because maybe in a year or two from now, you, uh, you have USB 4 is quite standard, and you want to boot your uh, USB key to install your, uh, this Ubuntu, and it might not boot, uh, so uh, because the proper driver is missing. You, some of you might remember uh, that that happened with USB 3 also, and uh, yeah, that's why it's important that the uh, support for the USB 4 is getting into the kernel now, because just uh, like some distribution that have come come out now are still relevant um, in uh, two years from now. Uh, uh, to be fair, um, and there uh, won't, will be this point releases from, from Ubuntu. They will likely then uh, offer the USB 4 support, so it won't be that bad. Um, but the server still will still use the um, um, kernel that's um, from the stock release, so there could still be a problem. So uh, another useful feature that's more for those uh, are, that are running Linux on, on, on their desktops, the support for recently released AMD CPUs, uh, GPUs got a little bit better. Uh, there was a new Radeon series introduced this summer that's called 5700. It's actually supported in 5.3 and MESA, so if you have a recent uh, Linux distribution uh, like Fedora 31, things will just work. Even newer cards like the 5500 um, uh, work if you install all the updates. And um, there actually is a 5600 card that was released just a few days ago. There you need 5.5 again. Um, but it's not that hard to, to add that to Fedora if you want to. Yeah. And uh, also regarding to graphic supports on desktops, the um, driver for these and older cards uh, from, from the AMD Radeon series actually is going to support OpenGL 4.6. It could, can, can be important for some games, um, but the really um, uh, uh, thing to take away from this is AMD finally really catched up and the support for, for, for the um, uh, recent AMD graphics is really good these days. Another thing from the um, uh, Good to Know series is uh, support for Intel's next-gen graphics uh, is also uh, getting much into Linux kernel these days, into kernel and MESA. And Intel's uh, graphics drivers also support, op uh, already support OpenGL 4.3, uh, 4.6 after preparing, uh, working towards it for like two years, I'd say. And um, so that's um, a major achievement there. Yeah. And I, I mentioned two drivers here. Actually, the i965 is an older um, OpenGL driver in MESA to support the recent cards. There's a newer one with, which uh, promises to be. Um, to offer more performance and uh, uh, to be lighter. Um, that's not the default yet, um, but uh, it might, looks like it will take over and, uh, soon with the next MESA release uh, that uh, uh, contains all the 3D drivers you normally install on your, on your laptops together with your distribution. So in the end, uh, AMD and Intel have quite good um, uh, FLOSS driver stacks these days. They are not perfect. Um, um, but maybe it's uh, simply like that. Uh, they are so good, maybe consider avoiding um, NVIDIA if you can. While talking about NVIDIA, a quick note, um, Nouveau, the uh, free and open source driver for GeForce cards, still leaves a lot to wish for. That's like it uh, for years now. 
For example, with the latest generation, the Turing cards, that, uh, for example, the uh, 1660 and the 2000 cards from the GeForce uh, uh, line, you don't get 3D support. That, that might make even your GNOME desktop and other desktop environments slow. And that's because there's no really distributable firmware from, from NVIDIA yet. It looks like this is about to uh, change. There were some patches recently that are also expected in 5.6 uh, that fix this, but I haven't seen the firmware yet, so it remains to be seen what's coming out of it. And uh, the, the biggest problem for the Nouveau driver still remains uh, where it is. Um, the driver simply cannot reach, cannot switch the GPU into their uh, highest speed states or their lower, lowest power sp uh, states because the distribution of firmware that NVIDIA offers uh, to Linux distribu uh, distributors to integrate simply doesn't support that. So this uh, free and open source driver um, uh, will never get the speed you get with the proprietary driver for now. So that's really a pity. Maybe it's uh, about to change. Um, there's an um, uh, NVIDIA developer conference um, a technology conference uh, in, in March, I think, and it, uh, in the schedule there's actually one thing that in, uh, indicates a little bit that NVIDIA might change their, uh, their strategy and get a little bit more open. Um, I'm not so sure if that will really happen. We have, uh, in the past few years, every, there were every now and then some indicators that, Intel, uh, that NVIDIA would become a little bit more open. Uh, in the end, they did uh, quite a few things to improve the situations, but on the other hand, in some areas, it uh, got worse again, so it, it uh, uh, in the end, got really, uh, the situation wasn't a lot. Uh, so I'm a bit skeptical what comes out of it. Um, um, yeah, let's wait for March and see, or maybe a little bit more. And uh, yeah, until then, for now, we have the good AMD and, and uh, Intel support. So one more good thing to know. You can use CLang, the, compiler, the C compiler that's built on LLVM, uh, to build kernels now on x86-64, so 64-bit um, x86 machines most of us uh, have at home. It might still be a bit bumpy, um, but uh, it can be of interest to use the security features that are in, in, in CLang and LLVM. Uh, if you're interested in that, there's a website about this that uh, has actually an issue tracker uh, where you can uh, check if you run into issues, if that's something that's already known and if it's something that needs to be fixed on the kernel side or the uh, C-Lang side. Another thing good to know is a PSI monitor um, that enhances the pressure stall information, PSI stuff that got added in 4.20. I talked about this last year uh, when I was here. The PSI stuff is basically proc load average on, on steroids because you can see a CPU and memory and I.O. Uh, in your own lines to check if, how the uh, pressure is and how, how busy they are. Um, I won't go into details. Um, if you're interested in this, um, uh, simply look at LWNNet or, or Google for it. Last year's uh, Major Hayden uh, wrote, a, uh, after my talk, wrote uh, a blog entry about it. That has, uh, it's easy to find the details there. But this PSI stuff got enhanced. Uh, there's a, uh, as I mentioned, it's a PSI monitor stuff that um, allows user land stuff to, to user land programs to better monitor what's happening there. And um, that actually allows way better uh, out of memory handling and um, can make you help your uh, uh, desktop shell from prevent from star uh, stalling because uh, in, in the background I/O is happening. And there are actually four solutions built on this. Um, um, one one is actually an Android. One from Endless. Um, the Facebook developers that actually that develop P PSI actually have an, uh, something built on that as well. And the GNOME Camp um, uh, has this early OOM. Um, that uh, promises to, to make sure the system runs uh, better. And the letter was actually proposed for, for Fedora 32 for integration that uh, triggered a big um, discussion on the mailing list um, So um, because uh, some people would prefer this, uh, this solution from Facebook. It's actually, uh, as that might be added to systemd directly. It uh, is still open, so... Uh, looks right now that uh, Fedora 32 won't get anything, any of this. Um, but uh, um, yeah, 
uh, maybe 35, uh, 33 or something, uh, then we'll, we'll see. Another thing good to know, bcachefs, um, that's also a file system that's uh, kind, uh, kind of competing with butterfs and zfs. Um, there was not much um, progress there recently. Uh, it will likely take years till, till ready, if ever. Um, it's still a one-man show, so I, I'm, I'm a bit careful about that, uh, how that works out. Um, uh, and be aware, it has a loud fan crowd already, really a loud fan crowd. Maybe it uh, won't be as good as anybody expected it to be. Um, hard to tell right now because, as I said, there's not much happening there. Just one developer uh, it remains to be seen. He wanted to get it merged into the kernel, that, as he said that, uh, two, one year and three or four months ago, but then not much happened since then. Maybe ButterFS is better suited, but now I uh, sound a little bit like a, a ButterFS fanboy, which I'm not. It's just uh, how it is. Uh, uh, I, hard, to, hard to say. So, and it's, uh, uh, I'm getting close to the end. Another thing good to know is the Linux kernel gets multipass TCP. That will be in 5.6, and to, uh, that was basically done here on the conference because Dave here uh, did this uh, yesterday, I think. Uh, he merged it to the uh, Linux uh, uh, net next tree that will, uh, where stuff for 5.6 is uh, prepared. And uh, he only did it for the uh, Twitter double mine. <laughs> I think I looked earlier today, you had a 250, uh, a lot of, lot of likes. And uh, yeah. And that's. Uh, Please follow me on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, the, the Twitter handle is mentioned here. <laughs> and give him, give him some hearts. <laughs> yeah. And that's actually um, uh, important if you're having going out of your, your laptop and out of the reach for the Wi-Fi, and then it uh, can uh, switch over to the mobile connection um, um, uh, 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 in the background, and your apps won't notice any of this. So it's really practical, especially for your, for your smartphones, uh, and that's actually the reason why uh, Android has something similar already. And uh, yeah. So uh, another useful uh, feature, I think it's the last one on my slides, um, support for Raspberry Pi 4 um, got, uh, gets improved uh, right now. As you might know, the Raspberry Pi um, is not using the upstream kernel. It uses a special kernel that has lots of added drivers. But some developers make sure the mainstream kernel, uh, the mainline kernel gets support. And 5.6, it will improve quite a lot. And if you're wondering why is that important to me, yeah, it's important to make sure uh, your Fedora, your, your Ubuntu runs on your single board computer uh, out of the box uh, better. There are lots of other stuff, uh, things I could talk about, um, but I guess a lot of people uh, uh, have something for the next time slot. Uh, that's why I'm not going into the details here. Um, as, I, as I said, this time slot um, right behind this is, um, is free. Maybe we can get back to this uh, in a few minutes, uh, but first I want to get uh, a few questions, ask uh, if you have them, and do the summary. The summary is Linux kernel is a fine-tuned engine, lots of things happening, fast development, uh, it's really great. The code of conduct that uh, created lots of uh, trouble in uh, 2018 uh, is not, nothing much heard of this year. WireGuard is uh, approaching, real-time is approaching, XFS now supports deduplication. For fast I.O., consider using this new A.I.O. technique, the I.O. Euring stuff. And uh, those were just the highlights I mentioned. Uh, and obviously, there's better hardware support uh, also. And the really big thing is the but, uh, BPPF really changes the Linux kernel. Uh, remains to be seen what comes out of it. If you want to know more about this, uh, follow LWNNet. That's a great site that uh, covers all the things I mentioned here, even in more detail. Uh, you can consider uh, following me as well on, 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 uh, on Twitter. As, uh, I have an uh, account that's called uh, Kernel Logger, where I always talk about things like that. Uh, I actually have three, uh, uh, six, uh, five other accounts. Uh, one of them actually is dedicated to, to the uh, Red Hat and uh, Linux, uh, Red Hat and Fedora stuff I do, uh, to keep things a bit separated and uh, yeah. And uh, one more thing, uh, provide feedback, talk to me uh, if you 
uh, how this talk was, what I should be improve, could improve. Last year there was something on, on the schedule to, to report feedback. I think it's not there this year. Uh, so, but I guess the uh, organizers will ask for feedback anyway. That's it. It's actually uh, slide 183, if anybody wonders. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but are there questions? There's a mic. Hello, I'd like to ask about that out of memory handling. If I have a program that keeps lots of data in cache, and uh, the OOM handler would kill the program. Is there some way how it could tell the program to re read the cache instead of killing the program? To, to reattach the program? Mm, to release the cache. If I have a program that has lots of data um, cache. I think from the Android camp there was some patches um, to um, uh, improve the situation where the kernel can talk, can ask userland uh, uh, stuff, yes. userland apps to release memory. They don't critically. Release. Yes, Android has this tombstoning mechanism. Yeah. That, uh, that Android has this tombstone mechanism where it yeah. basically asks the main class to save the information it's, somewhere. It's, yeah, it's a, uh, let's talk about it afterwards. And I think the solutions I mentioned. There's also uh, just user land solutions, so that uh, you can uh, actually program that. And uh, so can these user land solutions ask the program to quit in an auto release memory instead of queuing it? Do you mean if the programs can do that? The, the, uh, the, the out of memory is the user land demons or of the kernel? The demons or the kernel, I don't know which one, but yeah, yeah. it would be nice to get some feedback. Uh, yeah. Instead of be yeah, being the, killed. The, the short answer is kernel developers uh, actually from Google are working on this. And uh, I don't know what the status is, uh, but I think it's getting possible. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Right. One at the back. <coughs> we go, we're going to carry on with questions beyond 11 o'clock. So if you need to leave for another talk, do so. But the rest of us will carry on. Um, so I was a bit concerned with your comments regarding USB 4 not booting. Um, so does that mean there is no compatibility? Maybe, maybe wait 10, 10 seconds. Otherwise, I won't get your question. Yeah, now it's getting a bit, little bit. Yeah, so my question is, uh, your com you commented that USB 4, uh, you know, LTS, uh, Ubuntu 20 LTS would not boot on, UL, uh, on USB 4. The, the and for what? You mentioned that uh, your, U your USB key would not boot uh, two years down the road because the kernel did not support USB 4. Does that imply there is no compatibility with USB 3 or 2? How does this work, that work? No, no backwards compatibility to use. If, they, if there's no backwards compatibility to USB 3 and 2, yeah, because uh, USB 4 is basically um, Thunderbolt, and it has, it, it has some backwards compatibility to, to proper USB. So the uh, is fine. But um, um, if you have a USB 4 key or storage device, uh, that will only work if you have a USB 4 driver. And even if you have a backwards compatibility uh, 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 um, uh, uh, device that's actually connected to a controller that is USB 4 only, then you need support for that controller to make sure uh, it's, uh, to boot from it. But you could at least have the, the early stages of the boot which are handled by, the, by EFI or whatever. That part would work, right? Uh, you mean the, the boot stuff handled by the firmware? Or yes. Um, yeah, as soon as uh, the, the, the kernel runs, uh, the kernel has to do everything on your own, kind of. But so couldn't you just rebuild, uh, you know, just rebuild your init RD, oh, well, something like that? You basically, you basically need the USB 4 stuff support to, uh, if it's a USB 4 controller. <coughs> Uh, 
relative to uh, TCP multi paths. This will just left. Yeah, uh, I just want to bring up the point. This seems likely to be, you know, uh, a big contentious point because it will drive a lot of. You know, up a bit ah, okay. sorry. This will probably be a contentious point with regards to, you know. Um, a multi one a w a a n uh, router products in the market right if I understand it right if I have a, a a Linux shop essentially I can dodge those mm -hmm. and just use TCP multipathing to access my multiple w a n links yeah, the, the main I, I, it was so loud, it's, I, I'm not sure I, I got it. So if it's more, you, you, your question was if it's more for the routers or the routers or if it's more for your client? What? No, uh, my point was when I have TCP multipath, yeah. I can dodge my WAN routers. So my multi uh, WAN routers, right? And can access my uh, wide area network links directly utilizing that new technology. Or am I mistaken? No, that, that's possible, but uh, actually um, uh, there will be a use, uh, th there's the idea to have a user land uh, daemon that actually controls if you're using both links at the same time, or oh, uh, one will pre preferred, because you can't do that, that's policy, you have to do in user land that's depending on the policy. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's an additional good information, you know, bonding to basically max performance versus you know, non-bonding and just okay. do the but failover stuff. The, the main usage is you uh, uh, take your laptop and go to the garden where the Wi-Fi wi ends and then it can in, uh, switch to the uh, uh, um, mobile uh, connection uh, on, on its own. Yep. And I would have a question. Is there a chance that kernel will provide, uh, because the last year was the year of Intel's mitigation bugs, basically, which do have some impact on performance in some cases. And is there a chance that I, I would have an access to list where some performance impacts are like marked? That if I disable this mitigation, I will get this speed back or so something in the, that category. So, because there are too many mitigations today, and, and one does not know what really is impacting his his kernel. Yeah, that's there. There is no. I, I say that's actually not possible um, because um, the, uh, how big the impact of these mitigations is totally depends on on your um, on your workload. So, if you have uh, something that uh, does context switches a lot then this PTI and this spectral uh, stuff uh, might really hurt you. But if you uh, have not so much, not much uh, context switches, there's no, not, not, uh, not so, so much overhead, so you don't gain that much if you dis uh, disable the mitigation. And maybe the thing is, if you're really in a situation where you consider uh, disabling the mitigations for the CPU bugs, uh, does it actually matter which of those you uh, disable? That's, because that, you can, that's what I don't, don't know. That. Yeah, yeah. Um, from the security impact, it's likely not that much of a difference. Um, um, and uh, in the end, you actually have to try uh, which of those makes a difference. Uh, and the best starting for, point for it is actually a, a kernel parameter called mitigations uh, 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 off. Uh, that dis disables all the mitigations uh, uh, for, for those uh, CPU security bugs. And then you can able, enable and disable them uh, uh, one by one if you really want to. Uh, elaborating on that uh, question and answer uh, group of pairs here, in particular in the Spectre area of CPU bugs, Intel bugs, there is a zoo of Spectre incarnations, yes, so it's how they are called, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So my point is, it's actually pretty hard to uh, make that kind of decision. You know, can I disable like this very specific incarnation to optimize my performance in this, uh, you know, context switching heavy situation? It's much rather, you know, do I want to play it safe, or do I want to max out my performance, and then I have to basically uh, secure my system uh, respectively by other means. Yeah, but mo most of these bugs, uh, except for the um, uh, meltdown stuff, are, are really hard to use. And so maybe um, um, 
if you are in a con controlled situation where, where it's even possible to disable, then um, maybe um, disabling all of them except uh, PTI uh, stuff uh, that's protecting against meltdown might be possible. But uh, yeah, it's security. And if you disable security features, you always have to look into, into them closely to know what you're doing. Nobody, can, nobody else can do that for you. Uh, and that's what I look that the page would like quantify impact and, and performance and somehow yeah. so, so because I, I, I cannot track all those yeah. tens yeah. of mitigation so it's, it's like for me somebody simply needs to sit down and explain that on, on some web page I don't think that's anything the kernel could do any more questions and if you're interested in any of this or what I'm having up what did I do now? No. Um, just ask. Like, yeah. No, I hit the wrong button. How did I do that? Haha. <laughs> no, it's there. Uh, you can ask. I still have time. The next speaker is only expected in 10, 15 minutes from now. Or other questions for the stuff I talked about? No. OK. Then I leave you to it. Thanks for listening. Thank yeah, have a great conference. Thank you.